Tonight I wanted to talk about uh, strip assorptive extraction, some newer techniques that have uh, come into play uh, for flavor, fragrance, and odor analysis. Okay, and I have goals I want to accomplish with my talk tonight. Um, one of the things I've really come to appreciate in the last few months uh, with stir bar sorptive extraction is its versatility. It, it has a wider application potential than what most of us realize, I think. I've been just amazed. Uh, and I want to show uh, the application of this ethylene glycol silicon twister which was recently developed uh, for some unusual sample types and analytes. And maybe we'll explain some advantages uh, of SBSE over other analytical sample prep techniques for GC mass spec. Uh, how many, uh, can I just see some hands of people that are using uh, SBSE stir bar twisters? Okay, a few of you, not many. Okay. Um, the, <clears throat> the basic way this works is uh, we have a, a in the lower left uh, portion of the slide is a twister. It's a PDMS coated uh, magnet. Well, there's a magnet that's coated with glass, and then the glass is coated with polydimethyl siloxane. So it's very simple. And then to the right shows the ethylene glycol silicon twister that's been developed for the last maybe two years. It, the extraction technique is similar to SPEMI, but we get more enrichment because there's much more uh, absorbent phase. So this is another, go ahead, hit the buttons. Magnetic core, the glass coating, and then the PDMS. And it's offered in four versions. Uh, one centimeter with half a millimeter of PDMS coating to two uh, centimeters uh, with uh, one millimeter coating. So there's this whole range. Uh, and then the, recently, this new uh, phase, EG silicon, uh, and it's offered in one version. And this is uh, better for polar compounds and compounds that do hydrogen bonding. Uh, just to compare the twister uh, as, if we can just back up for a second, uh, the SPEMI, uh, the amount of uh, coating on a PDMS SPEMI fiber is only half a microliter. So we have, uh, even with the smallest twister of 40, 24 microliters, we have almost 50 times more absorbent. And it changes completely uh, how a twister works compared to a SPEMI fiber. I'm, I'm just going to talk about some application examples to demonstrate how well the twister works. Uh, I think most people that are familiar with twister know that it works well for liquid samples and you put the stir bar uh, in uh, usually 5-10 mils of sample, stir it, and then uh, dry it off with a paper towel, which sounds kind of strange, and uh, put it into thermal desorption equipment and then analyze your sample. Uh, and a few years ago, we published a paper in 2007. We did some testing with beer. Uh, we are looking for off-flavor chemicals in beer. And we uh, were looking at Miller. We were working with Miller. This is Miller Light Beer. And we look, looked at good beer, fresh beer, and then we abused the beer uh, either with heat. So we stored the beer for 12 weeks at 30 degrees centigrade, or with light. We exposed the beer to light and analyzed it, looking for off flavor chemicals that would develop. And this slide shows uh, we were successful. There are about seven different chemicals berferal, uh, ethyl nicotinamide. Uh, nicotinic acid ethyl ester, vitamin B3, the ester of that, uh, benzene acid, benzene acetic acid ethyl ester, beta damascenone. Beta damascenone has a uh, uh, great uh, flavor, uh, off flavor. Uh, and peripheral ethyl ether, and this is one that's not normally reported 
uh, in journals as off flavor, but it is a very potent off flavor chemical. About six parts per billion in beer makes uh, beer taste like solvent. Uh, so we were really excited to see that. Uh, in the control sample, we didn't see any, and then we got a nice size peak in the uh, abused, heat abused beer. Another chemical, furfural hydroxymethyl ketone, it's strawberry jam kind of flavor, which probably you don't want your beer to taste like. And that increased dramatically in the heat exposed <coughs> beer. And then 2,4 uh, dodecadienyl, uh, there was a trace of that that developed, which also contributes off flavor. So we were amazed how easy it was for us to detect these chemicals in uh, beer with a twister. <clears throat> in the light abuse beer, um, we took beer and exposed it to sunlight for eight hours. And in all, all these uh, examples I'm talking about beer, we used 10, mil, 10 mils of beer and extracted for uh, two hours. And we were able to detect uh, increases in sulfur compounds, dimethyl sulfide, I'm sorry, dimethyl disulfide, dimethyl trisulfide, and then we also saw an increase in benzene acetaldehyde. So we were very pleased with our results with the twister. Um, one of the problems that we find, um, th this is kind of my personal opinion, uh, Twister is such a fantastic technique and you can generate such incredible sensitivity uh, with these analytes. One of the problems you get because it's so good is there can be many peaks and you can uh, co-elute sometimes. So uh, it can be a problem. It's almost too good in some cases. Uh, I like to use the uh, time of flight GC mass spec which has uh, peak deconvolution capabilities so it can uh, decipher what uh, peaks that are overlapping and, and measure their mass spectrum very accurately and quantitate the area under the peak. This uh, example, this is a furfural ethyl ether. This might be one reason why it's not reported very often in the literature. Uh, the top chromatogram, the furfural ethyl ether, occurs in that circled, uh, in the downslope of that big peak and, and those minor peaks. And then it's magnified in the left hand, lower left hand chromatogram. And then when it does peak deconvolution, this one peak that's labeled coeluters is actually a combination of four different chemicals. And with the peak deconvolution of the time of flight, uh, that's a leco HT time of flight, uh, we can get a peak number three is the peripheral, eth peripheral ethyl ether, and we can detect it very well. Okay, uh, we want to look at uh, some new techniques now for doing beer analysis uh, that have been developed since we did this work in 2007. So, um, number one is SBSE with uh, one twister, it's represented in one on the diagram on the right. So we do two hours and just let the twister stir in the solution, 10 mils of beer for two hours and analyze it. Number two, um, if you double the amount of twisters, you should get maybe double the sensitivity. So we wanted to look at that. Do we increase sensitivity by using? We can thermally desorb uh, two twisters at the same time, so we're, we don't have to do two analyses. We combine them in the thermal desorption tube. And I'll, I'll show an example of that. Um, our friend, uh, in Gerstel from Japan, Nobu Okaya, developed a technique called uh, sequential stir bar sort of extraction. And uh, one way of doing it is to use two uh, S, uh, PMS stir bars and you uh, stir it for an hour and then you add one, uh, tw two grams of salt and stir for another uh, hour. So we have two hours of stirring. Uh, and what we do when we do this sequential technique by adding the salt, we take, uh, stir bar is really good for nonpolar compounds. By adding salt, we take some of the compounds that tend to be more polar and make 
to drive them into the stir bar so we increase our sensitivity for polar compounds as well. And then we, we thought, okay, now we have another technique just recently developed. Uh, we want to look at uh, PDMS, PDMS in the bottom, stirring a sample, but we have a, the new uh, ethylene glycol silicon twister, which does really good for more polar compounds, especially compounds that have hydrogen bonding. So we have these four techniques we want to compare, which is the best to use for beer. Uh, this shows how we attach the twisters to the side of the vial, the beer sample. Uh, Gerstel calls this, uh, calls this little magnet clip a twister, so you can put it, it has room for three different, there's three different little magnets, <coughs> and then you can put one in the bottom. So that's how we attach to the, it has to be in solution. Uh, you could do a technique where you put, move the magnet, the clip slides up and down the vial, and you can put the clip high so you can do a headspace extraction if you want to. Here, uh, this is uh, too much information on a slide, but it, um, the first chromatogram is what we see when we do just one PDMS twister, uh, technique number one. And the, the next chromatogram is our best technique. These uh, shark fin looking big peaks are uh, carboxylic acids, hexanoic, octanoic, decanoic, and lauric acid. And so those do hydrogen bonding. They bond to the uh, ethylene glycol twister really well, so we've improved our sensitivity. Uh, and you can switch to the, the other one. Other chromatograms are, are pretty good too. You can support. This is uh, just a small part of the beer chromatogram. And this shows what we uh, expected to see pretty much. Uh, this, the old thiamol is a, uh, or carbacol, is a, uh, from essential, uh, from the uh, hops, it has a uh, oregano type flavor. And there's a small, the smallest peak is one twister. The next peak is, has about double the amount. That's with two twisters, what we expected. Salting out uh, the uh, sequential, I called it, uh, has more of that chemical because it, it has a hydrogen bond. Uh, and then the biggest peak for thymol is with the uh, ethylene glycol and PDMS. And then this other peak, uh, P vinyl guaiacol, has a uh, clove flavor to it. And it's a flavor impact chemical in German style wheat beers, but in other beers it's considered an off flavor from wild yeast. So th this P vinyl guaiacol, which is the top uh, chemical shown, is a real important flavor compound, an off flavor compound in beer. 2 phenyl ethyl acetate, it's a floral compound, uh, honey, floral honey kind of flavor. And again, we see pretty much the same trend. One PDMS, we're able to detect a peak, uh, two PDMS twisters. Uh, over double the size, sequentially even more. So we're driving more of this polar compound into the twisters so we get bigger peaks. And the ethylene glycol is even better. We also see, by the way, other phenyl ethyl uh, esters. Uh, we see two phenyl ethyl uh, hexanate, octanate, and decanate. So it's an excellent technique for getting those. And the, the this is the last chemical I wanted to show is linalool. It's a uh, floral uh, odor with a spiciness to it. And again, uh, a little bit with one PDMS, double, and double, and then 50% more with sequential and even more with ethylene glycol. This is uh, maybe a best way of showing this data. Uh, it's a lot of information, but um, what we did was there are, I think, about 14 different flavor chemicals in beer that are really important for flavor and or off flavor. And when we use uh, the PDMS plus
plus ethylene glycol sequential test. Those are the, the back, the biggest peaks, the uh, purple peaks. And uh, all the data, the peak years are normalized to, to what we get in the biggest peak. And it shows that it's really the best way of analyzing for this, these 14 different flavor compounds. And one thing I want to point out is the hexanoic acid. The first uh, four, five chemicals are organic acids, carboxylic acids, and we get tremendous uh, sensitivity with those, and they're rather difficult to detect in beer, and this is a really good way to do it, just excellent. Oh, I forgot to mention this. These were Blue Moon beer samples. Just happened to be what I had in the refrigerator at the time. Now I'm going to switch gears. <clears throat> this this is really weird, uh, but I'm going to go from beer to body odor, <laughs> and there there doesn't seem to be a, a connection to that, but I'll I'll get to that. Uh -huh. um, I one of my biggest clients last year was a company that made uh, athletic shirts that had antimicrobial properties. And they claim that if you could exercise and sweat wearing this shirt and you wouldn't develop body odor. And they had to prove that with data. And so that was one of my jobs last year, which I never thought I'd ever do when I was in graduate school, working on body odor. But uh, I, learning a little bit about body odor was interesting. Um, when we perspire, we have uh, underarm secretions uh, from eccrine, apocrine, and sebaceous glands, and they're actually odorless. Our secretions really don't have an odor. But when there's bacteria on our skin, as there always is, uh, the bacteria will biotransform these uh, larger molecules into odor, smaller molecules that have odor. And in fact, uh, there's these uh, different <clears throat> microorganisms, and the cornea bacteria are the most important on the skin to cause this. And as you'll see, go ahead and you can just uh, propanoic, butanoic, pentanoic, two methyl, butanoic, isovaleric, I think probably the next one. Uh, and there's hexanoic, octanoic. The, the, uh, th uh, the three methyl two hexenoic acid is, is unique to perspiration odor, and it's really an interesting chemical. That once you smell it, it's exactly like body odor. It's, there's no question. I had a one of our physical chemistry teachers at the school bought a new textbook, and he brought it down one day, and he was complaining and shaking his head. And he says, "I don't know if I can use this book. It's making my whole office smell. It smells like body odor." And so I took a twister and I put it in the book and overnight and analyzed it and we found this chemical. It was in the ink somehow. I'm not sure if it was an impurity in the ink. Uh, the other, so these organic acids are, are really what the key to uh, studying body odor. And we are also interested in 2 non -enal. It's a lipid oxidation product. And that's an interesting chemical because um, it tends to increase in people over 40 years old. If you analyze perspiration from different people, you can almost pick out which ones are 40 years or older. Uh, as we age, um, we have uh, seven omega acids, unsaturated acids. that increase in our lipid profile, and these are oxidized to the 290 now. And uh, the other chemical we're interested in is a steroid, androstenone. And this is a kind of a challenging analytical problem because androstenone has a boiling point of in 270 or higher, 270 degrees centigrade or higher. Uh, it's not, a volatile chemical. So th this was uh, a challenging array of chemicals to analyze. <clears throat> OK, 
okay. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this shows kind of the strategy we use to uh, detect these chemicals. Uh, we took a shirt uh, and we cut out a patch of the fabric under, uh, after exercising under, under the underarm and we put, stuck a paper clip in through the uh, uh, GC vial and then we spliced the, the shirt, hung it from the paper clip. We put a Teflon coated stir bar in the bottom just to stir the air 600 parts uh, revolutions per minute and we put a PDMS twister and an ethylene glycol twister. So now this is a headspace sort of extraction. There's no solutions involved. We're just monitoring these chemicals and we heat this up at 50 degrees centigrade and we do this for two hours. And then what we do is we take both of the ethylene glycol silicon twister and the PDMS twister, put it in the Gerstle thermal desorption tube and simultaneously de desorb both of them at the same time. This uh, shows on the Leco Toff instrument the acids that uh, were we detected in, in this from this person. Uh, this was a cotton shirt. Uh, isobutanoic is peak one. Isovaleric acid peak two. Two methylbutanoic, very cheesy compound. Pentanoic, hexanoic, heptanoic acid, two ethyl hexanoic, octanoic, and nonanoic acid. And you can see we get really good uh, peak uh, sensitivity with this. This is uh, the chromatogram is plotted at uh, masses 60, 74, and 88, and it cleans up the chromatogram. We can focus on the, the chemicals we want. We're very happy to see this. When we uh, run standards by spiking the shirt with uh, microliters of these different standards, we use these acids, and then we did uh, we looked at either extracted ion at 60 or 74 or 113 for 2-nonanil uh, 70, and then androstenone at 272, and we did that in a sim mode, and our detection limit was. 10 parts per billion or less, and for androstenone, we got 0.4 parts per billion. Our uh, correlation coefficients were from 0.97 to 0.99, very happy, very linear. By the way, I had five levels of standards in the 10 to 500 micrograms per liter range. And then the method we use are listed, uh, they're all headspace except for androstenone since it's a non-volatile chemical, the technique that I described wouldn't work for that. So we did an isopropanol water extract of the shirt on the armpit, and uh, we took a portion of that extract and did a twister on it with a PDMS twister. And uh, being a high molecular weight organic chemical uh, that's uh, nonpolar, extracted extremely well into the twister and that's why we could get 0.4 parts per billion sensitivity. So we, we can do all the chemicals that are important and we're happy with the accuracy. Okay, we can leave the body odor behind and uh, this is another application example and uh, I wanted to talk about this because this is an example of a, a analysis where you wouldn't think of using twister. Uh, doesn't it sound like a twister application. Uh, casein powder. Casein powder is used as a nutritional supplement, a whitening agent for non for uh, non dairy coffee creamer. It's heavily used in the food industry. And in 2007, there was an epidemic of musty tainted product. And when I hear musty, the chemicals I normally think of are these that are listed here. 2-methyl isoborneol, uh, trichloroanisoles, and tribromoanisol. And you can look at the, uh, the, the odor thresholds are incredibly low. <laughs> nanograms per liter, this is like 0.1 nanograms per liter for the 246 trichloroanisole. The odor type is earthy and musty, and the molecular masses are they're high molecular weight chemicals. Um, so we didn't know for sure what the problem was, but 
this is our suspect list. When I was a kid and first started working at Dean Foods, um, we uh, imported casein from abroad and frequently we would get musty odor complaints. And this goes back many years since I'm not a kid anymore. Uh, and we, and I, we just, we tried everything we had at the time to identify what the chemical was and we never could. So it's interesting that 40 years ago there was this problem and then as the years went by the technology caught up and experience caught up and we're able to solve these problems. So this, this problem has been around a long time. Question is, where does this come from? How do you get trichloroanisole? And uh, what we found out was uh, pesticides in the, not too many years ago, contained uh, uh, trichloroanisole, uh, and so did wood preservatives. So the crates, the wooden crates that the uh, casein was shipped on their paper bags, some of the trichloroanisole would soak into the, through the paper into the casein. Casein has mold, and the mold, uh, we have uh, fungal enzymes that uh, could do omethylation, and they form the musty uh, trichloroanisole from the trichloroanisole. Uh, this, well, in 2007, this was a huge problem we had a pharmaceutical company that was having major product recall. They made nutritional uh, beverages. Uh, an ingredient company that had a chocolate flavored drink that used casein. They had a major product recall. A cereal company made nutrition bars had a major product recall. And uh, a non-dairy coffee creamer company, a smaller company, uh, was gonna go out of business because of this problem. This is a chromatogram uh, that's very complicated. Uh, there's coeluters galore in this, so that's why we go to the uh, Leco Toth MS. But this, we took one gram of the musty casing, added 25 mils of water, and stirred for half hour at room temperature, so we were able to extract an, enough of the uh, malodor chemical into the uh, into our extract and then we took our stir bar sorbative extraction and in this case we used since sensitivity was an issue we looked at a bigger stir bar uh, two centimeter stir bar with half a millimeter coating and stirred it for three hours why we chose this technique is because um, to decide if you should look at stir bar uh, with PDMS you look at the log of the KOW octanol water coefficient. Anything greater than 2.5, 2.7 uh, is definitely a candidate for surbar sorbative extraction and in this case 4.11 made it really favorable. Okay. To simplify the chromatogram, we, this is the exact same chromatogram plotted at uh, masses 212, 195, 161, and 196 which are favorable for uh, looking for those chemicals in that earlier table. When we did that, we found 2,4-dichloroanisole, uh, uh, an ice peak, 2,4-6-trichloroanisole, uh, which is the compound we were looking for as a, a good candidate. And we also found 2,3,6-trichloroanisole. At this peak at 1,200 is very interesting. It looks like a symmetrical spike peak, like a single compound. But when we use time of flight GCMS spec, we find it's not unusual to find 25, 50% more chemicals that you would never look for. And this is an example of that. This next slide shows a magnified view of that one peak after peak deconvolution. And it actually consists of not one peak, but three different chemicals. Uh, trichloroanisole, trichloroanisole, and butyl butanoate. So we're able to uh, detect those three chemicals, get good, accurate uh, mass spectrum spectra for them. And uh, that, that was really important in, uh, we were involved in a, as an expert witness, and we had that theory of how we formed the trichloroanisoles from the trichloroanisole, but 
uh, it's really nice to be able to show the trichloroquinolas here that helped us to win our uh, lawsuit. So peak deconvolution was really important. The previous samples containing the trichloroanisoles, those casings were from India. This uh, sample that contained tribromoanisole was from Australia. And when we do the calibration for these to quantitate, we use a, a technique called stable isotope dilution analysis. Normally, I have a small uh, consulting operation and I can't afford to buy deuterated standards, but this was for a big customer and they supplied the chemical, which was nice. So that, uh, this technique, uh, stable isotope dilution analysis or SIDA, is uh, one of the most accurate quantitation techniques for GC mass spec, I think. Okay. People are always interested in how good of quantitation do you get with speedy. And this is a, a good example. Um, we took our tribromal anisole that's deuterated and uh, in the 20 part per billion to 667 part per billion range, we got a correlation coefficient of 0.9943. And this is typical uh, for twister techniques, speedy, uh, SBSE techniques. I'm surprised when I don't get this type of uh, accuracy with, with Twister. When I get this type of accuracy with Speamy, I'm surprised. I have, it's just the opposite. I don't normally see that. Okay, this is my last example. Um, another uh, example where nobody would think of using Twister for this problem. Um, there's a company that makes snack foods, especially pretzels, in the Milwaukee area. And they had a product recall because their product had a musty taste again. The same type of problem. So we're thinking, okay, if you go back to that table, there's a list of chemicals. And uh, they all have a lot of KOW values that are favorable for extraction with PDMS Twister. So we thought we'd try it on this and we took uh, five grams of pretzels, add 100 mils of 15% ethanol, and mixed with a handheld blender. Allowed a few minutes for the solids to precipitate, and then we took 25 mils of the extract and did a two centimeter by half a millimeter twister extraction. And we analyzed with the crystal thermal desorption. Uh, this is on a just a uh, Agilent GCMS MSD. Uh, we did SIM mode at 112 and 182. And again, we picked twister technique with PDMS because of the log of KOW value was very high. Okay. <clears throat> and this is a calibration curve. Uh, we found jasmine in the samples and this is our calibration curve again, 0.999. Or, uh, and this interesting it's from 50 parts per trillion to about 600 parts per trillion so it's very very low and you have to go that low because the odor thresholds are that low and this shows uh, the uh, chromatograms the controlled jasmine that there was no complaint had about 10 parts per trillion jasmine <coughs> and the uh, Complaint samples had 360 to 384 parts per trillion. Um, the source of the jasmine was the uh, processing water that was used to make the pretzels. The uh, company used uh, municipal water from a water treatment plant and they weren't uh, doing a good job removing the jasmine that was, for, uh, the water came from Lake Michigan and uh, during spring seasons, uh, late spring, they had algal blooms and blue-green algae likes to produce the jasmine. So they had to put special carbon filters. So that, my point tonight was, you should look at Twister for things that you think may, you may not find as the best technique because uh, it's surprisingly good. 
I'd like to uh, acknowledge the people that helped me with my work. Uh, Charles and Jacob Lasconis, uh, they are my grandsons. Uh, they've, uh, Charles has worked with me for about five years in the lab. And they do really good work, especially as I'm too old to do a good job with olfactometry now. I, I use them a lot, they're good at it. And at Gerstel, I'd like to thank uh, Ed Fat Van Kosh in Baltimore, Nobu Okaya, the fellow from uh, Gerstel that uh, is out of Japan, he's done some fantastic work, and Joe Binkley uh, at Lico in St. Joseph. So they, I have to give credit to all these people.